He's probably the greatest player that a rogue have had. To have somebody that the children could relate to, he's held on such high regard. I mean, like, I've got a couple of kids now, like, I mean, we meet Shane every swap and we meet him on the street or something, my guys go over and give him a high five. Like, I don't think the guy realises what that high five does for my guys. Without doubt, Shane is a folk hero in Ennis, and, uh, you know, we'll never forget. The goal scorers are what the kids really want to see, and they're, when they're in their backyard hitting the ball against uh, their the wall or whatever, they're calling themselves Shane O'Donnell. Yeah, so it's pure excitement now at start of March, to be honest. Um, you can kind of start to feel that it's coming towards the summer, even though maybe the conditions don't feel like that now. But you know that the championship's just around the corner, especially the last couple of years, they've kind of brought it forward. First round this year is 21st of April, I think. So you really are staring down the barrel of that, that six week period that you build into championship, uh, which is kind of that critical period where everybody's coming back in. The physios have targeted this period to get everyone back on the pitch. and. So there really is a huge amount of excitement building now. There's a part of I haven't been hurling so much, so it's really thinking I really need to hit the ground when I get back. In the last couple of years, it's been just been a pretty good feeling coming back in and just getting the first couple of days and first couple of sessions done. And it had just basically concentrating on bringing that energy because John lads are just finishing the league. They may not kind of notice that it's coming into this period, but coming back in as a jump person who hasn't been involved you get to kind of consciously bring that energy and try to lift the training a level or two. As a young lad, Shane O'Donnell was part of a family of four boys, yeah, so he was the third. He was just lively, he was one of the four, so yeah, lively kid. We would always be playing hurling out here in the back if there was any decent bit of sunshine at all, like goal set up there, so you'd be poking the ball around. So that was kind of going on constantly. Like Hurling was really normal part of his growing up, just literally back garden stuff. Stop being under my feet in here, would you just go into the garden and play? It was purely an enjoyable thing. There was no pressure, I don't think. It was just fun. Like He loved hurling. Hurling's good fun. One of the things uh, I didn't realise about him, I underestimated how determined he was, really. Let's, let's put it that way. That's probably, I was saying, he, he gets the whole team thing. That's, that's no problem. And he plays uh, for the team and with the team. And the team is everything. But, you know, when he does get that ball and he does decide he's going to go for goal, it's very hard to stop him. Shane O'Donnell quietly learned his craft on the pitches of Aer Oge Ennis and St. Flannan's College. And then all of a sudden, in the space of literally one game, it was very much the opposite of quiet. His iconic performance against Cork at Crow Park in September 2013, a hat-trick in the space of a few minutes, and suddenly a star was born. Throw in two All-Stars and an Allianz League title, and 10 years on, Shane O'Donnell is still doing his thing, albeit the road has been far from straightforward. If the summer is the attention-grabbing high-rise, the foundations are laid in the league. And in 2016, Clare won their first since 1978. 2016 probably is the standout. I think that was a year where, this time of year, we were really motoring well. I think we had had a, we had had a setup at that time where every match we'd have, we've had maybe a board after you'd write some quick notes on. And we also had our overall tally for matches that year. And between the pre-season tournaments, and the league, I think we had won maybe, I think it was 11 games by the end of the league. So each time you were coming in, you were just thinking, yeah, we haven't lost a game yet this year. Things are really going well. We'd beaten a couple of really good teams in the league and yeah, we were feeling really confident. So that was probably the most prepared I felt coming into a championship at this, at this period, at the early March stage. I just remember it being an extremely tight game. Waterford had always been kind of difficult game for us. We played quite similar to how they wanted to play, I think, and uh, they were also quite tactically aware um, in some ways some of the teams that we were playing weren't at the time. So when we played against them, it was also quite always a close game, and that year no more than any other year. Obviously, we'd drawn the first game, which is, you know, obviously you can't get any closer. So it was always just this tactical kind of dogfight back and over, 
scores were kind of at a premium. In some ways, it kind of resembled closer to what some football games might be expected to be like. We were very familiar with Waterford by this time of the year, and we'd played them, this was probably going to be our third game, fourth even that year. Okay, here's, here's an opportunity. We, this is going to come down to one ball. And that, it really kind of does focus you because you, you realise that if you miss a touch or if you catch a ball and beat a man, that will decide the game. So it really does focus you on, on the here and now, which is John kind of brings out some of those incredible moments and games. And really, when you win those games, and John, they're incredible to win. But yeah, it definitely does. You, you notice, everyone knows, the crowd knows as well, this is going to be one ball. And uh, yeah, it's an extremely exciting part of the game. 2013 is quite a while ago now, but uh, the league at the time was six teams in Division 1 and then there was a distinct Division 2 which did not kind of combine together. So the league was extremely competitive. You had your six teams that you really did not want to be relegated. That was the absolute priority when it came to the league that year. We played Cork in a relegation final in the league and we won that. And it actually did set us up for the year. It really felt like we'd won a big game against Cork. You have to remember before 2013, we really were not competing against these teams at all. We were firmly in the second tier. So to come into the league that year, to compete in the top division, to, to survive in the top division and to relegate Cork was a huge deal. And we definitely took a lot of uh, inspiration from that running into the championship. It would have given us a lot of confidence. Twenty thirteen. Blessing or a curse? Oh definitely a blessing. Sometimes I talk about it in negative terms, but it's definitely the best thing that ever happened to me. So I don't think I could ever pretend that it wasn't a blessing. You get the nod that you're starting with just a few hours to throw in. This was to curtail nerves. That's the it's the old school don't tell him until he's about to go out. So it was the morning of the final? Yeah, it was even the afternoon, I'd say. It was literally when we were eating food, which was three hours before the game, basically. But I think genuinely everybody else knew in the panel. Uh, multiple people came up to me directly after and be like, so you know now, and started talking to me about the tactics of the day. So <laughs> Jimmy Barry Murphy had come out after all of it happened and after the match saying that he knew two days before. So I, I don't know how that happened. And then he came on and he scored the first goal and I was like, okay, whew. Thank God that justifies starting him <laughs> because you're just terrified that he gets this great opportunity and it just, you know, it mightn't work obviously because he hasn't played in front of 80,000 people before, I don't think. Superstar. Yeah, in hurling circles, it, it, yeah, it's, for a year it was also outside of hurling circles but that thankfully didn't quite last. Mm. Um, it was crazy, yeah. I expected it to kind of die down at any stage, I think, in the first couple of weeks. I wrote those off being like, Joe, things are going to be crazy and yeah. whatever, but it just did not really die down. Just did you, did you enjoy the first few weeks of craziness, the homecoming, all of that stuff? I enjoyed elements of it. I enjoyed the homecoming a lot, but anytime I was outside of the bubble of the panel, I didn't really enjoy, I would say. Um, when we were doing something as a team, like the homecoming or those kind of things, there was enough of us to kind of dissipate the attention. But then when I was doing things on my own or I went back to college or anything like that. On a normal night out down in Cork in college, things were really intense and really just didn't enjoy that side of it. What happened if you go into town at 10 a.m. on a Saturday? Just, I take pictures with people for the day, basically, which is crazy to think about looking back on it, but that was essentially what, what would happen. I would uh, either get pictures or as people got more drunk, receive more and more abuse over, I was in Cork as well, so a certain amount of it is probably warranted, but um, it gets tiring pretty quickly. Oh, I suppose you couldn't take something that big and say it didn't influence him. It must have been hell for him, really, you know, because, I mean, everybody wanted a piece of him. You know, no matter what nightclub he'd go into, where, what hotel he'd go into, you know, people would be looking for photographs, autographs. I mean, the whole thing went crazy, I suppose, really, yeah. Just wanted it to go back to normal, really. I mean, delighted for him, so delighted Claire had won. But we weren't really the sort of people that wanted all the, that adulation and sort of attention, really. There was a lot of media interest, obviously, as well as sort of local interest and club interest and county interest and all that, so. That winter of 2013 and into early 14, like you, if you wanted to, I suspect, could have been doing lots of interviews, sponsorships, late, late show appearance, whatever you want, you know, you, you name it. 
I don't remember you milking it. I'd said I didn't want to do anything. And they were like, just do one radio, one TV and one uh, print uh, media day or yeah. something. Rip the so, plaster. Yeah. So that was what I did. I think I did one kind of bigger newspaper piece with the Times. I did, I think I went to Marty Morrissey's radio and then I did Late Late Show. I had no illusions that I was going to be scoring two, three goals a game. So I never had that real pressure on me. I also had this level of confidence after that, that I just could do anything basically. So when I went back training the next year, I was playing the best I'd ever played. A lot of, a lot of things changed with concussion. I'd say my style of play lended itself to putting myself in danger, put it, like physically, literally putting my head down and, and whatever happens, happens. On top of that, when I moved out to Wingford and realized I was gonna, where I was going to be playing, I kind of got a heavier hurley and I started doing my own shooting and you'd be surprised how much of a difference just changing the hurley would make. I used to have this really light thing that was easy to flick around and get the ball close to you. But if you'd hit it more than 60 yards, the thing would more likely break than it would send the ball. Your dad designed the hurley? My dad makes the hurleys, yeah. Designs as well, yeah, I guess. Yeah. This is full-time job or just on the side? No, he's an engineer, so this is on the side. Which means that the, the pace of Hurley's coming out is like two a year. And just me and my brother both need them, so... <laughs> it's a bit of a crisis when one breaks. I presume they're good, are they? Yeah, they're good for us anyway. Martin makes them from scratch. He doesn't have a mechanised system, really. It's very, very labour-intensive. So they take hours and hours to make when he does make one. I, I probably do insult to uh, a lot of the, the good, the hurley makers around the country like in what I do. Uh, I've made hurleys for him, I've made, but I make one or two hurleys literally a year. It's made from a hurley that, um, uh, you know, that, that he's happy with. Anytime I'm in a new panel, it was funny, we did the hurling for cancer um, this year in Carlow and I walked into the dressing room and Suddenly my hurley was being passed around and everyone making comment on how awful it looks and I'd forgotten that that happened because I've been in the same panel for so long. Everybody would look at my hurley and be like, how can you use this thing? But yeah, it's quite different I'd say, it's kind of shaped differently. There's some design considerations. He, he would say it's the best hurley in Ireland. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I think the secret with his hurleys in a lot of ways is that he has the same hurley for years on end, like, two, it could be three year old hurleys he's hurling with, like, and they've been broken, they've been fixed and broken and fixed and broken and fixed, and then it becomes a, a hurley you're very familiar with. So anything I, I make new, like, will be a direct copy of the old, I try and match the old to, to a new hurley. This is really more trying to get to what an old hurley that's been used and he's comfortable with and he has got a good feel for a good touch with. It's more to do with that than any uh, secret formula in terms of, of hurley making. Let's talk concussion. This has clearly had a seismic effect on you, on your career, on the way you play hurling. 2021 happened in training. I have read your arms were trapped in contact, head hits the rock hard turf. Do you have a memory of it? No. No. I don't have a memory of even two hours before it, getting ready for training and going to Cusick Park and I have kind of intermittent memories of the next three or four hours after. There was a lot of things going on at the time. His, uh, uh, Oshin, his older brother, was getting married uh, in, in Donegal. We were halfway to Donegal at that stage when a Thursday evening sort of, uh, I, I got a call to say, look, you know, uh, Shane's a bit of bother. He's in, uh, in the regional Ennis. He didn't seem too bad, to be honest, to start with. And then they weren't doing a whole lot. And we sort of, he finished up getting transferred to Limerick, but we'd said we'd bring him in because they were going to have to wait for an ambulance. So we finished up bringing him to Limerick. And on the check-in in Limerick, he was able to tell them his phone number and stuff. But even on the journey in, he couldn't, he couldn't remember anything. And he kept asking the same questions. He kept going, where are we going? What are we doing? And five minutes later, he'd be like, where are we going? What are we doing? What are you doing here? What happened? What time is it now? How long since that happened? But the thing that kind of sort of scared me was that he wasn't really aware of his brother's wedding at the weekend. So that uh, set off alarm bells in my head anyway. And, uh, yeah, Neil brought him to Donegal for the wedding and he was not too bad for the couple of days of the wedding. 
How soon after that incident do you and your family and the doctors realise this is a bit more serious than first thought? Probably a week or so. Probably a week. I had a strange kind of grace period after it. It, it was my brother's wedding, so I was... I went straight to the wedding and there's so much going on in that that it, and I wasn't really like looking at my phone or watching TV or doing anything really that involved kind of the triggers essentially that I later understood were going to cause my symptoms. So I kind of felt of okay really like I, I had no real symptoms but the like random outbursts of like crying which was really strange but that was probably all I had for the first couple of days. Your brother probably just thought you were emotional. Yeah, right? yeah, that could all be just pinned <laughs> on Oshin's wedding. So. But that was probably it for the first two or three days, and then I tried to go back to work, and that's when it, there was kind of a slow decline. Okay. So you mentioned phones, screens, those triggers result in blinding headache? I went to kind of different phases. of The first phase was like this no really intense nausea, basically. So I would have a really strong pressure in my head, kind of in the middle of my head. It would just feel like it was in a vice all the time, and then I would have eight or ten, eight or nine out of ten nausea, could be getting sick at any moment. And that was a permanent feature for probably two weeks, I would say. So, and it would kind of ebb and flow. It would be that I would feel so bad that I would just sit down for the entire day and then go to sleep, kind of nodding in and out of sleep as well. I was sleeping a lot. And then the next day I would feel the slightest bit better. So I would stand up and I would walk around and I would talk to my parents who were in the house and trying to take care of me. And then because I had done that, the next day I would feel even worse. I would feel like completely just incapable of doing anything. So it kind of like went up and up and down, but the general trajectory was was down. Like each day that I was getting worse, I was feeling worse than I'd ever felt. So it wasn't like any other injury where you the worst is at the start and you improve. This was like a real tough two or three weeks of like getting actually worse every second day. I was in a place where I just started to think that this was what my life was going to be like, that I would never get out of this hole basically. And that just became like a lot of people talk about like depression and stuff being part of concussion. I think that's where it's come from, just this despair that you're not going to get your normal life back, basically. One of the guys in the club, his, uh, his son was uh, over from Canada and he wanted to, uh, he wanted to, the kids, uh, his kids wanted just maybe a, an autographed Hurley or uh, whatever, like, and he dropped into Hurley's, like, and he was sort of, uh, he asked me a week, week afterwards, like, is there any chance? collect them, whatever, because uh, they were going back to Canada. And I was saying, well, I, I can't, not only does he not know his name, he can't sign his name, really. So he was kind of like, anything to do with focus, uh, uh, screens or phones or literally anything at all. He was just uh, just not, he couldn't function like him. So it was quite scary. Yeah. We sort of believed, you know the story that used to be out there that the first hit you'll recover from, but if you don't, this, it's the second one really that you need to worry about. So in that sense, we were sort of thinking this would resolve itself because he'd never, to my memory, had a bad, bad hit before that. So that almost it was, it was okay, not that it was okay, but just we expected him to come out of it pretty easily. But then after two or three weeks, it wasn't, it just wasn't getting better. It was very, very terrifying, yeah. Yeah, like the days were, I had four or five weeks where my day consisted of getting up, eating breakfast, going to the sitting room and sitting down. That was it. I used to sit down for 12 hours. And could you read a book? I couldn't read a book. Yeah. Couldn't read a book and couldn't look at my phone. Couldn't look at the TV. Even talking to my parents was difficult if I had to maintain eye contact with them. So any conversation was like me like a zombie looking at the wall like this and them talking and I would stay like this. So that was it for five weeks. So like the days are very long. <laughs> you don't know it feels like five years. Yeah. How do you navigate your way out of it? So I'd met with a number, a couple of GPs, my brother, and he hates me mentioning this, but I'd met with him and he had told me relax and rest and everything. And the team doctor and everyone had kind of just said the same thing. And then. I'd been asked to contact a person in the UPMC, which is like a concussion network in Ireland and originated in the US. And the first thing they did was send me a, a, like a test basically online. They emailed me a test to do on my computer. It was like 20 or 30 minutes. And it tests like your reactions and your memory, I think. 
and I just rang them. It's like, I can't do that. I can't look at my computer. Do you not understand? Like, I can't, I'm not allowed to look at my computer. You don't have a clue what you're talking about. So I refused to do it. And then the doctor actually, uh, Enda Devish, rang me two days later and was like, Shane, just do the test. It'll be fine. I'll tell you why in a couple of days. I'm meeting you on Friday. Just get the test done before then. And then that was where it turned. Okay. So counter to the instinct, they prescribe rehab in a sense. They get you active, they get your eyes moving. This is, I mean, it, it's probably not publicized enough, but this seems to increasingly be the route out of concussion. Yeah, exactly. So it was, you come in and I met him and he explained the kind of category of concussion I had and he talked me through my test results. And then basically after I recovered from that and started thinking I might be normal again. And he said to me like, you'll make a full recovery. That was probably the most important thing I'd heard all that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was very tearful over that, obviously. But then he did some tests in there. So that was what turned out to be my rehab was these kind of tests where you would be like tracking like a lollipop stick with your eyes and you'd have stickers on the walls. You'd be like kind of flicking your eyes between. Th these were the tests that I was doing in there, but they turned out to be the rehab exercise as well. At the time, even the idea of like, like I'm looking at you, it'd be like shaking your head while keeping like eyes fixed on it, on the lollipop stick. That was, I nearly collapsed in there trying to do that. And he was like, okay, it's going to take some time, like, but you'll, you'll make a recovery doing them. So basically just went back doing essentially a rehab, mm -hmm. doing those exercises and they made a huge difference. The hurling then was just kind of put on the long finger really. Like I think, I think eventually I went back after 11 weeks after, which was probably another five weeks after the, the going back to work. That was after doing two exit exams, basically just do a full battery of testing after you do like basically a, a small fitness test to kind of drain you. Um, and at that point they cleared me to go back with the club. So I went back playing at that point. Mm. But very nervously, it's the, not surprising, not surprising, but interesting aspect of going back. You know for a fact, contact is coming your way as a hurler and you've got a lot going on in your life do i want to risk it how do you let yourself go in that environment and be and be fearless because you probably need to be fearless to be a hurler that's no joke to take that risk and it would have felt like a risk yeah definitely felt like a risk i was extremely reluctant i would say i think i got cleared a few days before a championship game we were playing our first championship game for the club Claire was done at this stage. I, I'd taken no part of the Claire campaign. So our first match was on the weekend and I'd been cleared just a few days before that. And I basically made an agreement. We, we were favorites to win the game. So I made an agreement with the manager that I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna play unless we were in a dire state. So we came up with a figure of like eight or nine points down at half time. Okay. If we were eight or nine <laughs> points down, I would come on. Of course we were eight or nine. I can't remember what it was, but we were the exact amount we had pre-agreed. <laughs> down at half time, so I it's took to the pitch then. It's a conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. Club, to be fair, can be, you know, can be, I mean, inter-county is obviously, is phys physical in its own right, for sure. But, w you know, once you almost win your ball in, in, in inter-county, you have a little bit of space and you have a bit of room, whereas club, you don't get that, you know, it's just, just uh, it's pure intensity from start to finish. Yeah, the first game we watched was pretty scary, I must say, you're just, just watching and like in the normal course you're watching and you're hoping he'll play well and you're hoping he'll have a good game and that the team will win and all the normal stuff but you're watching every little run like because he was playing in the forwards so you're just terrified when you see him going for a ball in case he gets taken down. He did get a knock in one of those games and he got a bit of a rattle from it. And you're like oh my and then you're watching to see if he'll get up and you're just, you could feel the tension between the two of us watching it. I, I went on to the pitch, literally the first challenge, I got clotheslined by someone. Um, now he kind of pulled out of it. Unfortunately, we had played Newmarket, who had actually had someone who had a bad concussion the year before. So they were, they were, they were almost pulling out of challenges. When I, when I started to run in some ways, I remember that clothesline, he, he went to do me and then pulled out. That's quite nice to hear as opposed to, let's finish him off. Yeah, yeah. And I remember after the pitch, a lot of them came up to me and said, it's great to see you back. And we have one of our players is still struggling with it. And you know, it's nice to see you, whatever, et cetera. So that was actually really nice. It's good to hear because the GAA, when it comes to physicality, can get a very bad rap. 
Yeah, so well, I, yeah, nice I to hear. Yeah. yeah, it was. I, that was a nice entrance back. But two matches later, I had probably the other side of the coin where I had one of the opposition jeering me about he's going to do me and I'll spend the rest of my day in a hospital and this kind of stuff. And, and he did. He pulled on my head later that game. So He did not. Yeah, yeah. Now, it's my fault. I went in for a goal and kind of jumped for the ball and he swung kind of hard. But I would have came off. Then I came off. That was probably 10 or 15 minutes to go and I took myself out of the game and basically was test, doing the te same test that Endo would have done on me and trying to understand whether I had just sustained a concussion. And then that night I would have went to bed and woke up in a total frenzy. Because I had struggled, I had struggled a lot with sleeping at the time when I got the concussion. I would have had a lot of symptoms and a lot of like difficult kind of sensation in my head basically. I woke up in a frenzy experiencing the same symptoms. And I was like, can't believe I'm back here basically. Now looking back on it, I didn't have a concussion. It was totally a figment of my imagination, but I was so afraid of going back to feeling how I felt that summer that my brain just was in such a frenzy and panicked mm. about it that I just couldn't distinguish what was real from what wasn't. So the next morning I'm having my porridge if I'm you and I'm saying, not come back. I'm not risking some lunatic every two or three games deciding he's going to make a name against me and have a pop at my head and I'll get another concussion. I'm done. Yeah. And that was basically the entire winter, this kind of internal dialogue. And it was very heavily weighted in the, like, I'm not going back because I just couldn't justify, I couldn't justify how I felt that summer. And it just wasn't worth it. Like, honestly, when, if Clare won the All-Ireland the next year, I would have been delighted for them, but I would have been delighted from the sidelines. And I was like, I'd fully accepted that that was, that was how it was going to be. Why did you go back? It was almost because I was so afraid of it, it that I went back and my girlfriend, I mentioned earlier, a psychologist, so she would have kind of, she's dealing with patients with trauma and stuff. And she was saying that I was, my symptoms that I was dealing with after, like these psychological symptoms were manifesting in a way that someone would have my, very mild, but complex, like a simple trauma kind of patient that I, this, I, my body had processed this as a traumatic event. And um, she basically said that, like all things, the way to get through these is exposure, like exposure to what you're essentially afraid of. Um, so it kind of put me in an interesting place where I wanted to play hurling. And hurling was essentially the, the solution for this traumatic process or whatever it was to actually get over this fear was to go play hurling. And it's, it's funny listening to you uh, like a theme of this series is stop the drop as in teenagers people of all ages stop playing sport and it's you know you have gone through so much to go back and play your sport so you must feel very deeply about the benefits of it and, and be able to speak to the pull of it so uh, sport and, and what it means to you give us a sense of, of how it's enriched your life because you've like I said jumped several hurdles more than most to keep playing sport when so many park it. Yeah, I think it's hard probably to summarize it, but I think a lot of it is the emotion and feeling I get from other people around me. I think I was actually just in Kilnana GA Club last Saturday. Uh, myself, Connor Whelan from Galway and John Conlon, our dad's and mother, Connor's mother, are all from this tiny area called Faha, in, which is in the remit of Kilnana GA Club. And they were basically commemorating us all getting the All-Star in the same year. And I was there in this small, like, hall, basically, that was jammed to the rafters, probably, probably three quarters of the population in Kilnana in there, and was brought up on stage and was, had, like, an interview kind of thing and looked down on one stage and my dad was in tears. So I think the emotion that I see from other people around me is really what I think of when I think of why I'm so glad that I've gone through everything I went through to continue to play, basically. Harvard in 2018. A Fulbright scholar, from what I can see, this um, means you're pretty much regarded as amongst the best of the best in your field outside of the US. Is that about what a Fulbright scholar would represent? 
So as much as I would like that to stand as the record of what a Fulbright Scholar is. <laughs> Don't let your humility <laughs> ruin this. The original idea of the person Fulbright who set it up, I think he was a senator in the US, he had been abroad a lot and he kind of understood the importance of like seeing other cultures and understanding the perspective of other countries and people. And a lot of the emphasis is on when you're coming from another country to go to the US, your ability to go to the US and then share your home culture with the US. So, so it's kind of half and half. You go with, uh, with a research question and an idea to, this is the research I want to do. This is the lab I want to do it in. Probably didn't realize that he was, you know, that bright. Uh, the, the whole family, like, to be fair to them, are, are sort of academic. I'll put that down to, uh, uh, to my wife, Mary, really. Whatever he turns his hand to, you know, you know he's going to make a success of it. Why does science interest you? Why does this world interest you? What, what attracts you to it? What attracted me to research was just that you would become an expert in this. You would push the understanding of, of every person in the planet. Even the small, like, maybe niche area, whatever it is, that you could make a difference, that you could crack something that would you know, be able to share it and maybe make some products that would help people or to reduce or alleviate disease or whatever it might be but that you could make that individual progress yourself. So that was something that just really excited me and that was what I was kind of drawn towards research. Did I read you say that uh, in an ideal world, some stage in the future, space travel would be very much on your radar? It definitely would have been. That was something that I always wanted to do and I think having done as my PhD in the science kind of career, that does lend itself to it. And interesting enough, microbiome research is actually something they do on the ISS. So it's something that would kind of be compatible with that. The issue is I can't go with NASA because I'm not an American citizen, so I have to go with the European Space Agency, but they only do recruitments for astronauts every eight, 10, 12 years. So I think there was actually one a few years ago, just before I finished my PhD, that I couldn't go for. So now I'm kind of like in the, you know, doldrums a small bit with that. Say it's five, 10 years, next round of astronaut recruiting they do may be too late for me. Ah, uh, Shane going to space. There's a bit of me that thinks that's just a challenge now, really. But uh, I'm sure if he actually put his mind to it, he probably could achieve it. Yeah, it's, it's just a different level of things. And it probably in one level would combine the sporting, because you have to be incredibly fit, and the academic, because obviously they're not just sending you up there to puck a slither around. Well, I don't think they are anyway. I, I, I can't speak for Mary, she probably would have no problem in him going into space and wandering around space. Me, it would terrify the life out of me. So your hopes for 2024? To win the All-Ireland basically.